Okay, hi out there in the YouTube land. Okay, so I'm um, going to be doing a little book kind of review. Uh, I'm gonna, Tristan is actually going to be so kind as to read you a chapter from this book. It's The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by John M. Allegro. And yeah, it says, Did the Christ figure evolve from a primitive fertility cult? The controversial bestseller about the origins of Judaism and Christianity. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's a really good book. Um, on the back, it actually has a picture that says, uh, A Christian Fresco Showing the Amanita Muscaria as the Tree of Good and Evil in the Garden of Eden. And yeah, there you have it. Um, yeah, Tristan's going to read you a, a chapter from this, and I just, I did mention this in one of my earlier videos that I did on, like, Jesus and all that, and I discussed uh, that there is astro-theological implications in the Bible, um, you know, such as the Twelve Trials of, of Hercules, the, the Twelve Zodiacs in the sky, got twelve hours a day, twelve hours a night, there is some sacredness to this number 12 you know even on a clock got noon like one two three four twelve like that number has been um kept for a reason because it's a sacred number that connects the earth to the heavens and it's not just um astrological in its implications there is plant and mushroom mythologies embedded in it as well and sexual rituals and sexual magic and sacred sacred sex like a lot of people cringe at that and it's been so transformed from the original cult that it used to be to what it is nowadays um which i don't know someone even on the last video i posted about that said like i'm leading people astray and like that i'm going to be responsible and that i'm like this horrible person i think i'm really really smart not to pat myself on the back, but I've read a lot of books and done lots of research into these topics. And I do know what I'm speaking about. And anyone else out there who doesn't feel that way, well, maybe you shouldn't be watching this video because I heavily believe that through the Kabbalah tree of life, there is the dark pillar, the light pin pillar, and the gray pillar. And there's many routes and different directions that people can take in this life. All paths lead to heaven, which is at the top, okay? That's my belief. Now, you can believe that only one possible path exists, and that's your path. But I'm fully, like, arms open in love and kindness that for all religions, like, I mentioned this in my last video, that my heart isn't this little narrow door. It's got a lot of love. And I can embrace Hinduism and Judaism and Christianity, the Bhagavad Gita, the St. James Version. I can embrace whatever I'd like. And it's through embracing of multiple perspectives that are all studying God, which I believe they all have different names for him, but they're all studying the same phenomenon. And I fully believe that only through integration of these different facets through their own cultural expressions that that's the only best way to get the fullest understanding of this God figure or Godhead or Jesus and all of these different representations like Krishna consciousness in order to have an understanding of these things we have to do our due diligence and our research so yeah that's enough for my little intro and then uh, you're gonna hear Tristan reading now so See you later. <laughs> Bye. The Mushroom Egg and Birds of Mythology As the virgin goddess plays an important part in fertility cults throughout the ancient world, so the virgin vulva of the sacred mushroom, her real-life counterpart of nature, figures largely in fungus nomenclature and mythology. Yet the mushroom is in some respects a hermaphrodite, displaying characteristics of both sexes. 
With the stem at full stretch, as we have seen, the Amanita muscaria seems to the ancients like an erect, fiery-topped penis. But if the vulva is sliced open before it splits of its own accord, there will be found inside a fully formed mushroom waiting to expand, like a fetus in a womb, or a chick in an egg. It is small wonder, then, that the mushroom is spoken of as a womb, and many of its folk designations and imagery come from this concept. One such name we have already noticed is Peony, the holy plant, and, in mythological terms, Peter, Barjona. Using the same Sumerian element in the last part of that word, Iauna, fertility, womb, and prefaced with the Sumerian word Gig, shade, protection, there came into Semitic the name Kikayon, pod plant, used for Jonah's mushroom sunshade. That same, root, that same word in Hebrew represented also a plant of quite different kind, but which also had a pod or womb-like fruits containing the laxative with which nursery tummy upsets have made us all too familiar, castor oil. Our English translators of the Jonah story have sometimes had the unfortunate prophet seeking shade from the sun under a castor oil tree. Our word uterus comes ultimately from a Sumerian phrase Ushtar, with the same meaning. A fuller form of Barjona combined bar Iauna with Ushtar to make the Greek name of the holy plant, Peristerion, which became the most important for mushroom mythology in the Greek-speaking world and particularly in the New Testament. The old botanists not unnaturally connected the name with the dove, Greek Peristera, thinking the holy plant must have been the natural habitat for these birds. In fact, the connection is much more direct. The bird's name in Greek, as its equivalent Yona in Semitic, Jonah's name is the same word, actually means womb. The reference to the bird is secondary. A number of birds are, like the dove, connected in ancient nomenclature and mythology with, with fertility and the womb, and thus with the mushroom. The dove is traditionally associated with peace, the word for which in both Greek and Semitic has an underlying significance of fertility and fruitfulness. In Hebrew, the delightful word shalom is used, like its Arabic equivalent salem, as a traditional greeting, peace. But it is more than not being at war with anything or anybody. It has, like the sound of the word itself, a sense of being replete, content in the terms of the old fertility philosophy, in a state of balance with yourself and the world. Those people of the ancient Near East who gave us our culture would have viewed our concern with the pill with, an, with incredulity. The barren womb was a plague from the god. A woman without a fetus in her belly was an insult to her sex and her man. In that house, there could be no shalom, no peace. The dove symbolized fruitfulness. As nature is composed of opposites, and as the fetus is born of the white sperm of the male and the dark red blood of the female, so the white dove has its counterpart in the black raven. Its name can be traced back in Greek and Semitic to the womb idea, and it too is traditionally associated with fertility. The Greeks invoked the raven at weddings, and there was a curious idea that, like the dove, the raven laid its eggs or mated through its beak. Pliny poured scorn on the idea, and thought it was just a way of kissing. Nevertheless, he quotes the old wives' tale that pregnant women should avoid eating raven's eggs, lest they bear the children through the mouths. It was the same observation of the manner of courtship of these birds that led the Romans to call a man who indulged in labial kissing during sex play a crow. It was a raven that was sent out first from Noah's Ark to survey the flooded world, and it was a dove sent out later that brought back evidence of new growth in its beak. In the Old Testament account of the creation, the Spirit of God hovers like a bird above the primeval sea, wafting with its wing beat the breath of God into the slime from which the world was made. So Pliny speaks of the famous breath that generates the universe by fluctuating to and fro as in a kind of womb. It is much the same imagery that portrays the Holy Spirit fluttering down on the head of Jesus at his baptism, making him, too, a Barjona, son of a dove. 
Another important example of the winged creature fertility motif in the Old Testament is the idea of the cherubim. The modern popular image of the cherub as a rosy-cheeked and underclad infant with diminutive wings owes more to the late artistic conceptions of post-biblical Jewish angiology than the Old Testament. There, the cherub is pictured as a strange hybrid creature having two, four, or six wings, counting Isaiah's seraphim as of the same order, and one, two, or four heads, human and bestial. Yahweh rides upon a cherub, swiftly upon the wings of the wind, and is one of the is the one enthroned upon the cherubim. This last figure refers to the throne of Yahweh in the Holy of Holies of the Jerusalem Temple, where two cherubim stand on either side of an arched canopy over the Ark of the Testimony. The outstretched wings of the cherubim form Yahweh's throne, and it is there that the God promises to meet Moses and his high priestly successors for oracular consultation. The cherubim are here exercising a protective function as they do in the Garden of Eden, scene of the primeval creation. Similarly, Ezekiel speaks of them as screening cherubim of the anointing in God's garden. In classical mythology, the counterpart of the biblical cherubim are the griffins who guard the source of treasure near a cave called the Earth's Storebolt, the entrance into the womb of Mother Earth. Like the cherub, the griffin, is, the griffin is pictured bearing the god on its back, and drawing the chariot of the fertility goddess Aphrodite with her charioteer Eros. Ezekiel, and following him late Jewish mysticism, makes much of the cherubim and related chariot imagery. To the prophet, in some form of hallucinatory trance, they appear as grotesque apparitions in a storm, surrounded by flashes of lightning and roars of thunder. They move not only on outstretched wings, but with whirling, eye-studded wheels, having in them the spirit of life, and they bear the glory of Yahweh from the temple porch. Above their heads is a canopy, and beneath it their wings are spread, two for flying and two to cover their bodies. The mushroom imagery is here dramatically evident. The prophet sees the Amanita muscaria, its glowing red cap studded with the white flakes of the broken pellicle from the vulva. In this skin lies the hallucinatory drug, one of whose properties is to enhance the perceptive faculties, making colors brighter and objects far larger or smaller than, than their real size. Philologically also, the cherub griffin is related to the fungus. The names in the Indo-European and Semitic go back to another pod or womb word, gurub, similar in meaning to the source of the name of the well-known pod plant, the carob. It was this carob that supplied the horn or uterus-shaped pods eaten by the prodigal son. Pliny described them as not longer than a man's finger, occasionally curved like a sickle, and the thickness of a man's thumb. The name had another reference in the ancient world, however. The Akkadian botanists used the same Semitic word for carob to describe the Sumerian seed of life plant, the mushroom. The association between birds and the womb must have been in part due to the similarity seen between the chick and its pellicle of the egg and the fetus in its uterine membrane, just as Pliny drew a parallel between the baby mushroom and its vulva and the chick and the egg. But for the idea of the outstretched wings of the womb-like birds, the cherub griffin, one should look to the fancied resemblance between the wings and the so-called horns of the uterus, the fallopian tubes which branch out from the top and terminate in the ovaries. A stylization of this kind appears in the Egyptian hieroglyph representing the bicornate uterus of the heifer. It was this kind of imagery which brought together the name of the palm tree, Phoenix, with the most famous of all the womb birds of mythology. The relationship of the palm tree, with its long stem surrounded by a canopy of leaves, and the mushroom will be discussed later but the similarity between them both and the stylized uterus will be immediately evident. The phoenix bird was for centuries a favorite theme of mythology and philosophers, pagan and Christian. It was believed to burn itself alive on its own nest and end an extremely long life, and from its body or ashes which had become fertilized there came forth another phoenix. This offspring was, in some versions, 
created from the beginning a perfect replica of its parent, or, according to other reports, grew from a preliminary larval stage, like a grub. The phoenix bird mythology is another piece of mushroom folklore. As the, phoenix, as the fetus is generated in the furnace of the uterus, so the mushroom, that evil ferment of the soil, as Nicander calls it, is created a womb within a womb, as it were. Like the fabulous phoenix, the mushroom is self-generated and regenerated, bursting forth from the vulva, only to die as quickly and then apparently miraculously to reappear, a resurrection of its own self. A great deal of the mythology of the ancient Near East hinges on the theme of the dying and rising god. It is usually, and correctly, seen as symbolism in story form of the processes of nature, whereby in the heat of summer the earth's greenness disappears in death, to reappear the following spring in new birth. But as we shall see, in the life cycle of the mushroom, this natural cycle was quickened to a matter of days or even hours. The fungus was a microcosm of the whole fertility process, the essence of God compressed into the womb and penis of the hermaphrodite mushroom. It was long ago suggested that the phoenix bird was the stork, ever the type and emblem of maternal and filial affection. The Latin name for this bird, Siconia, is almost certainly derived from the Sumerian Gigayuna, pod of fertility, the Hebrew Kikayon of Jonah's sunshade mushroom. That it was the shape motif has earned for the bird this mushroom name seems to be indicated by the use of Siconia in Latin for a T-shaped implement for measuring the depth of furrows in the field, as if this were the obvious characteristic of the bird as it stood on one leg, its body forming the canopy. The swan is another of the fertility birds. Possibly its long curved neck seemed to represent the vaginal passage, whilst its white body was the uterus and its outstretched wings were the fallopian tubes. The Greek and Latin names for the bird, though which we have received, are synjet, are pod names, derived from a Sumerian, gugnu, seed pod. In classical mythology, Zeus takes the form of a swan to mate with Leda, and from the union she was delivered of an egg from which came the heroine goddess Helen and her twin brothers, Castor and Pollux. The whole of the story is mushroom-inspired, as we shall see, and the very common twin mythology of the ancient world comes directly out of the mushroom cult. When the egg or vulva of the mushroom splits into two, one half is left in the ground, the other forced upwards, upwards by the expanding stem or phallus, borne aloft as a canopy towards the sky. In those simplified terms, anyway, the old mythmakers saw the development of the fungus, and from that conception they formulated many stories and characters having to do with twin children, bearing names related to the womb and the penis. When the offspring are combined into one person, like Adonis, Apollo, Dionysus, and so on, he is often pictured as a beautiful, rather effeminate youth, a favorite theme of the classical sculptors. On occasion, this person is a hermaphrodite, a mixture of both sexes, the prime example of which was, as the name implies, the offspring of Hermes and Aphrodite. In the following chapter we shall look at some twin stories derived from the hermaphrodite mushroom and at the, symbol and at the symbolism it evoked. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed Tristan's uh, reading from the book and I just wanted to add in here because I know some people will be like Jesus had nothing to do with, with anything like psilocybin mushrooms or Amanita muscaria. And I really have to, sorry to have to tell you this, but um, many, many tribes all over the world, like even when me and Tristan went on a trip to Australia, uh, it's a ritual, it's a very common ritual for all around the world that... Uh, to be the leader or a shaman of the tribe, um, that like the headmaster, so to speak, you had to undergo certain drugs, like certain hallucina certain hallucinatory properties were induced on you. And if you couldn't handle it, then you couldn't handle being the leader. And it was seen as gaining spiritual insight in the world through connecting with these sacred divinities, which can be found in these plants. 
And it is very strange how in our modern times all of these things are, you know, cut off from people. They're not made available and they are heavily stigmatized and looked down on. When really, a lot of the answers lie in those things. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed Tristan's reading and this video. Please give me a thumbs up, share if you'd like to, and I'll see you in the future. Bye for now.